Hello. So welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. I keep saying this. We're not just bums on seats, are we? We are not just bums on seats. And we're not just here to speak, to, to watch someone at the front and nod our heads and say amen from time to time. And No, this is, this is church. It's about being family. It's about being interactive with together, together and like encouraging one another and loving one another. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Today, I've got a lot of writing, I've got a lot of reading uh, for you. Uh, I'm going to start off with a very nice poem, as it's Mother's Day, you know, and we'll see where we go from there. Is that okay, church? Yeah? The night was dark, for the moon was young, and the stars were asleep and rare. The clouds were thick, yet youth went out to see his maiden fair. Dear one, he pleaded as he knelt, before her feet in tears. My love is true. Why have you kept me waiting all these years? The maiden looked at him, unmoved it seemed, and whispered low, persistent youth, you have to prove by deeds your love is true. There's not a thing I would not do for you, beloved, said he. Then go, said she, to your mother dear, and bring her heart to me. Without another word, youth left and went to his mother dear, he opened her breast and took her heart, but he did not shed a tear. Then back to his maiden fair he ran, unmindful of the rain. But his feet slipped and he fell down, and loud he groaned with pain. Still, in his hand he held the prize that would win his maiden's hands. But he thought of his mother dear, so kind, so sweet, so fond. And then he heard a voice, not from his lips, but all apart. Get up, it said. Were you hurt, child? It was his mother's heart. That was written by a guy, by Jose La Villa de Tierra, back in the 30s. It, it just tells of a mother's heart that even though she may be hurt, she may be wounded, yet the love that she has for her child still carries on. I have another one for us. She used to be my only enemy and never let me free, catching me in places that I know I shouldn't be. Every other day I crossed the line, I didn't mean to be so bad. I never thought you would become the friend I never had. Back then I didn't know why, why you were misunderstood. So now I see through your eyes all that you did was love. My friend, I didn't want to hear it then, but I'm not ashamed to say it now. Every little thing you said and did was right for me. I had a lot of time to think about, about the way I used to be. Never had a sense of my responsibility. Back then, I didn't know why, why you were misunderstood. So now I see through your eyes, all that you did was love. But now I'm sure I know why, why you are misunderstood. So now I see through your eyes, all I can give you is love. Mama, I love you. Mama, I care. Mama, I love you. Mama, my friend. That was the Spice Girls in 1997. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> very nice, very nice. Uh, life began with waking up and loving my mother's face, said George Eliot. And Pope Paul VI said, Every mother is like Moses. She does not enter the promised land. She prepares a world she will not see. It's deep, isn't it? Start, start thinking on these things. It's, it's true. I want to read a story for us today, tell a story from the Bible about maybe the most significant mother that ever lived. Mums do a, a fantastic job. They really do. We, we did that, we prayed for the mums. We, I, I, Joe, you know as a parent myself, I, I see and I, I experience the difficulty of what it is to raise a child. Um, and we do that in the context of, of uh, two of us doing it. Uh, and for some of you, you do it alone. Uh, for some of you, you do it through much greater hardship. 
And I, I honour that and I respect that. And, and, you know, if today is a difficult day for you, um, you know, I, I can only apologise. Um, it, it can be tough. But today I want to honour mums particularly, and particularly I want to highlight, like I said, maybe the most significant mother that ever lived. In the evangelical world, we tend not to speak about her too much because it's kind of a pushback against you know, other Christian traditions. You know, sometimes we, we think that they, they may take things too far, but, but the reality is, is regardless of your tradition, regardless of your background, there are lessons to be learned from the life of this extraordinary, extraordinary woman. I'm sure by now you've worked out who I'm talking about. I'm talking about that young lady, Mary of Nazareth. Now, Mary was a young girl when we encounter her in the Bible. Sophie, can you stand up please? Everybody take a good look at Sophie. Now, you could imagine that maybe Mary was her age when we first encounter her in the Bible. Just bear that in mind as we go through this story. You can sit down now. Thank you very much. That wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> but this young lady had been raised in a very rural area in the north of Israel, modern-day Palestine. And uh, she had grown up going to synagogue and being taught by faithful parents. And she had been taught from a very early age that she was actually from a royal bloodline. You know, the Bible records for us in the Gospels that if you trace her heritage back, you know, her forefather was King David. And the same is to be said of her future husband as well, Joseph. And so you'd have grown up with these stories. And there was a major Roman centre close by, a town called Sephoris. It was about three or four miles away, over the ridge. Okay, so maybe that is a place where they would have gone and maybe to, to get their groceries or to go to Aldi or, you know, to, to go to Tesco's to put petrol in the car. But in the town that they came from, Nazareth, it was a very small village, maybe 100 to 200 people. It had a small synagogue and didn't, fe fe um, didn't see very many people. And uh, that's just the kind of place it was. It was a real rural backwater. Nobody ever thought that anything significant would ever happen in Nazareth. So imagine this young girl growing up, hearing these stories of her great heritage, worshipping God faithfully, living her life in the service of God, just running her day-to-day -day life. Would anything good ever happen to this young girl? Yes. Could you imagine anything to happen if you grew up nowhere, nowheresville, in nowhere land, in the armpit of the Roman Empire. Man, imagine her options. But we first meet her in the book of Luke, 1 verse 6, and I'm going to do a lot of reading for us today. And I'm going to just point out a couple of bits, and at the end, I've got a couple of lessons for us. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so in Luke 1 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Now Mary was greatly troubled at his word. Now imagine this, you've grown up, nothing, nothing has ever gone on in this place, and you've gone out for the day to collect water or you know, to gather some food or whatever, and an angel turns up right in front of you. Now I don't know if there's a modern day equivalent to that, except an angel turns up in your living room when you least expect it. But could you imagine? Just picture the scene for me a moment, will you? You're there, getting some water, maybe, 
and you look up, what? Hello, what's this? So she was greatly troubled at this. What a detail to put in the Bible. Of course I expect we'd be greatly troubled if an angel appeared in our lives, wouldn't we? What's this angel going to do? What's this angel going to say? I don't know, but we'll find out. She was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But an angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. And here comes the promise bit. We, we, many of us know the promise that she was given that you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Hello? (coughs) But... Some of us have had, like, God's promises over our lives. And what do you think of that? Like, now, today, in this age, with, like, hindsight of Scripture to help us to understand these things. There she is, an angel's just appeared, and she's been told, this young girl, how would you feel, Sophie, if an angel turned up at home and said, hey, girl, you are going to have the Messiah what a freak out, right? You, you are. You're just going to freak out. Like, you've grown up understanding there's going to be a Messiah coming at some point, and you're the one. She hasn't even done her GCEs yet. So, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, she's a sensible girl. She asks a sensible question. Notice the fact that as she's asking this question, how will this be since I'm a virgin, that actually, even though she's already betrothed to Joseph, her future husband, like she's not expecting to be unfaithful to him. Why would you ask that question unless she was expecting to be faithful to the one that you're committed to? I oh, know. It's deep. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. And her response to all of this, this like freak out moment, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. (coughs) Now, great faith in such a young girl, right? Greater faith is she going to have in the future. We know this, and she didn't. But seriously, wrap your heads around this whole scene. So she's got a decision to make, right? So she falls pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is a bit weird in itself. I mean, let's face it, you know, it's not the usual way of doing things. And she's got a decision to make. How does she approach this to her future husband? How does she explain this to everyone in the village? How is this going to look in the town of Sephora, just down the road? I mean, who knows? So what does she do? She goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. I mean, but why? Does she want to escape? Does she want to just think it over? Did she want to talk about it with someone who's received the promise of God already and get that kind of wise counsel? If you received a promise from God like that, or even not like that, if you just received a promise from God, a prophecy, maybe, what would you do? What would be your first steps? Mary, I think she's quite a smart girl. She goes to speak to someone that she can trust and take herself away from the situation just for a moment because the emotion surrounding it is going to be great. So she goes to visit Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now this by itself is like a bit of a weird thing because she goes into the house Maybe she hasn't seen Elizabeth for a few months, but she goes in and Elizabeth is like, hey, 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 and Zechariah's like, 
Elizabeth says, it's all right, he can't talk. Like, Dan Daniel's like, you know, what? So, anyway. And so when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Go to your cousin's house and have them shout at you like that. Hello? Weird, weird. Anyway, but why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How did Elizabeth even know this? Right? Yes, like it says that, that as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. But how, what indication is that, that Mary is, is bearing the son of her Lord? Oh, man, angels get around, they, they reveal things to people, I think, that, you know, it's, it's not all written in there. We know what we just need to know, but read between the lines, people. There's, there's a lot more to this story. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And in Mary, because I think she's a creative type, you know, she's quite a creative girl. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. She starts singing a song. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. I'm not going to sing for you, by the way. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, just stop it there. My soul rejoices, my spirit rejoices in, in God my Saviour, because she recognises that she's a sinner, just like us, and that she needs a Saviour. God is her Saviour. She is not, like, exempt from God's grace and judgement and his mercy on, on her life. She's not exactly, she recognises this for herself. And then, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And she had no idea. No, 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 no idea. You do not know what promise of God has got for your life. You've got no idea what the future will hold for you if you trust, have faith in the promise of God for your life. Because she says, all generations will call me blessed. Now, 2,000 years is quite a long time, but I don't think there's been a generation that's gone by since that time where people have not said Mary was blessed, right? It happened. How did she know? She, I don't think she did know, really. But the Bible is true. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts, which is a bit of a warning for us. You know, don't get proud in your inner being. Yeah, remain humble, people. You know, Mary, she, she recognises this. She was a young girl and she recognised this. How much more for us older people should we recognise this? Just saying. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. She knew her Bible. She knew the scriptures. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. And as she returns home, if anyone has seen a woman that is pregnant, after three months, there's not very much hiding the fact that you're pregnant. You know, maybe, you've, you know, it looks like a bit of a food baby, but it's, it's getting there, it's starting to show a bit. Like, very shortly after that, it is clearly not just, you know, too many McDonald's. Do you know what I mean? Yeah? So... But Joseph had to know by now, and he faced his own struggle. The guy that you're about to marry is now faced with the reality that you're carrying a child that is not his. What a head screw. Like, seriously. Uh, and we don't know if, like, the things that, that went through his head were that he believed her story and found, thought that maybe he was unworthy. You know, we, we don't know that. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But maybe he thought, well, maybe she's telling the truth. She's been an honourable girl all her life. Like, maybe she says this angel came to her. But we, we, I, don't, I don't know. But maybe she is telling the truth. Who am I to, like, to raise the, the, the Messiah? Do you know what I mean? Who, who am I to, like, help to fulfil this promise in her life? A possibility. Maybe, 
he thought that she had been unfaithful. I mean, they lived just a few miles away from like the Roman capital of Galilee. Maybe she'd gone there to pick up some eggs and a Roman had like, had his way with her or something. Who knows? He doesn't know. Like, he's just got her word to, to go against, isn't he? Like, what a difficult, difficult situation he finds himself in. But as a mum to be expecting, what a difficult situation she finds herself in. She's faced with this possibility of this guy that I love, this guy who's probably the only like eligible bachelor in the town, it's only a small town, remember, like the, the only guy in the church that is good for me doesn't want to be with me anymore. I've got to raise this kid on my own. And, it, and it's not just I've got to raise this kid. I've got to raise the son of God by myself. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so... Um, this is the struggle. This is the internal struggle. All this has happened in a really short space of time. So how did Mary feel during his struggle? I don't know. Did she lose faith? Did she doubt? Did she wonder? Anyway, moving on. In Luke 2, it records that in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register, the town of their forefathers. Yeah? So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary. They've sorted out their differences. Joseph had a dream. Now, your, your spouse to be someone that you love, has got this massive promise on their life and then you have a dream about it still I'd still have a couple of internal sort of struggles going on but he steps out in faith too and decides I'm going to stick with her we're in this together now she's had this angelic word over her life I've had a weird dream like, maybe this is actually happening. So he goes with her. He sticks by her side. That must have been great for her, you know. I mean, imagine it, ladies. Uh, anxiety is kind of reduced a little bit. But off they go on this long journey. Now, we don't know, like, how far pregnant she was. You know, if she's four months pregnant or, like, nearly nine months pregnant, that's still a bit of a trek. It's like... It's a few days' journey, this, and all they've got to go on is like some beat-up old larder. Like, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a nice journey to have. You know, the suspension's gone and everything, like, bumping all over the place. Mate, I, I've got a heavily pregnant wife. I struggle to go down Cemetery Road with those bumps. Like, well, I don't She does. She struggles to go down Cemetery Road with those bumps. It's not a comfortable feeling. Imagine going from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Like... Yeah, not nice. Anyway, so while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. These men, full-grown men, are out in the field facing all sorts of dangers every night and they're terrified of an angel. An angel appears to Mary, this young girl still at school, not quite done her GCEs, and like, she was troubled by the angel's words. What a girl! Go on, lass! But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I'll bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go and inconvenience this young family because they haven't got nothing better to do. Yeah. Like, hello, just had a baby. You're not even in the hospital. In fact, you're not even at home. You're in a cave somewhere, surrounded by stinking animals. You haven't got any, like, 
any like, onesies till I put the kid in. So you just wrap them in cloths, stick it in the feeding trough, and you are bothered by some smelly old shepherds coming out from the field. <laughs> now, when we have children, generally in our household, we put a sign on the door that says, don't bother us for two weeks at least. Like, we're getting used to this thing. But no, they have to just humbly and graciously just say, yeah, come on, shepherds, like, come in. Man. So anyway, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed. I mean, they were shepherds after all. If a shepherd came to you, I don't know what a modern day equivalent would be, but if someone like, with a lowly position came to you and started saying, I've just seen the Son of God and it's been like, amazing, and, like, he had a halo around his head and you want to see the paintings that they're going to paint of him like, in the future, but it, it was an amazing experience. I can tell you, let, who believed them? Who would have believed them? So Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart because she is a thinker. Imagine, she is still only about 16 years old, just had a baby, gone through this massive trauma of travelling miles, feared losing her husband, had the child in a a, a dirty stink hole and invaded by all of these people. Like, that's enough trouble of itself. But she's still pondering, she's wondering about, she's thinking about this stuff, like, God's promise to me is being fulfilled before my very eyes. How do I deal with this? What's the next step? She's constantly thinking, what's what's the next step? She's thinking about it all the time. Well then, shortly after that, we don't know how much shortly after this, people say maybe a couple of years, but they had to run away. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Like, he's getting a lot of these dreams, like... Maybe she's thinking he's taking LSD or something, I don't know. But like, he's, he's having a lot of these weird dreams. But, you know, it, it, it rang true in the past, so why doubt it now? Yeah? God's faithfulness, you know, we can, we can lean on God's faithfulness in the past in our lives to help us through the future, right? Amen? So again, he's getting used to these, so, so must Mary be getting used to these, these funky dreams. And he said, get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he did that. Joseph got up and he took his new little family, all right, and they went off to Egypt. Now, we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. We don't know if any of the others had been born at this point or whether any of them were born in Egypt. But they was away for a couple of years. Maybe Jesus had a sibling on the return back to like, his homeland. But this young mum has had enough upheaval, upheaval in her life, yet she's still just going to remain firm, remain strong, and still f- see this thing through to the very end, even if it means moving country, which some of you have experienced. What a tough one. What a difficult, difficult situation to find yourself in. So, the Magi come, Herod's done all that, he's killed a lot of the kids, and... Uh, they return back to Nazareth after a couple of years. The Bible skips forward. It misses a few years of his life. But it tells us about the fact that every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, where they were faithful, God-honouring, worshipful parents. And he was 12 years old, and they went to the festival according to the custom. And it was like, a bit like going to conference for us. right? So... After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Have you ever lost a child that's in your care? Right? Have you ever lost the Son of God? Right? Man. After three days, they found him in the temple courts. Three days of, like, torture in their mind, in her mind. Like, she's, like, been entrusted with this great, great responsibility. And he, he got for three days. It's not just, like, wandering around Tesco's and he's down, like, the milk aisle, you know. It, that's bad enough. No. Three days. Man. So... They found him talking to all the teachers 
and asking them questions, and they was asking him questions, and they was all amazed at his great wisdom and understanding. Man, we know this. But why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Quite often at this point, we highlight Jesus' wisdom, you know, that the Pharisees and all these like, f- like professional religious people are going, oh, your son, he's very, very wise, he's so very great. We, we never really think of the implications of what they are experiencing. Like, when your child chats back to you, your first response isn't, oh, isn't he wise? <laughs> Is it? No, it's not. Could you imagine... I know, I'm saying imagine a lot. This takes a lot of imagination, this message today. But put yourself in these people's shoes. As a young mum, she's probably got several kids now. The rest of them are with her. And the one that's like the promise on your life, the one that is like, you know, he's going to save the world, has gone missing. And then you find him and he's like, yeah, chill. It's all right. Oh, Oh, Let's not even go there. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Good, right? Children, let's be obedient to our parents, yeah? So, but again, his mother treasured all of these things in her heart. She kept thinking about it. She was aware that something more was happening. It was a much bigger picture than what she was currently facing. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. And then, of course, a few more years goes by. We go from the age of 12 up to the age of 30. What happened in the meantime, we don't really know. Maybe Jesus like, grew up and he helped his mum out around the house and he went to Sephora and did some carpentry with his dad and like, built a little business going up there. But he knew that there was something bigger for his life. She knew that there was something bigger for his life, but a lot of time has gone past from then to now. We talked about this recently. Like, Abraham had a promise on his life and 25 years elapsed. What do you do in the meantime? That meantime is a long time to hold on to a promise. That meantime is a long time to think, is God still with me? Is he still there? Does he still listen to me? I don't know. Who knows what she was thinking? But the time comes when they've gone to a wedding Now, at the wedding is Jesus and his brothers and sisters and some of the disciples that he'd gathered, like from John, earlier on. So on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus, blah, 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 all that. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, who cares? Like, I'm at a wedding and if my mum said to me, they have no more wine, I'd say, well, then they should go and get some more or I'll just have some water, thanks. Whatever. But no, she tells him. Why does she tell him? I think she she was very aware of who he was. Even though all that time had gone past, and we don't know precisely what happened in that elapsed period of time, but she was still very aware of who he was. And he says to her, Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. But his mum said to the servants, Look, You might not know who this guy is, but I do. Just do what he tells you. She had great faith in him, even at that time. Nearby stood the six stone jars, and uh, Jesus told them to to fill the jars with water. And do you know what's important about this point? Is the fact that Jesus honoured his mum. If you're a child in here today, and you still have your mum with you, it is Mother's Day after all, let's remember this. Go home and honour your mum. Give her a call. Say hi. Tell her you love her. Honour your mum. And they did what he said. And we know what happened. And then, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, where all of the disciples, uh, with all of the disciples, and, and the thing is that she had accepted these disciples into her family. I think they all went together. I oh, know I'm running a bit long now. We'll be finished shortly. But th- th- do you know what? Like, if my mum, if I invited all of my mates around to my house, my mum would have a fit, right? But like, here is this this lady who's like raising this guy. He's just done a miracle. She's just witnessed the miracle for herself. So have they. And they're all just going on holiday to the seaside together to this town of Capernaum. Very nice. 
Later on, we see that Jesus is, you know, he's started his ministry and uh, crowds are gathering all around him all the time and uh, the Pharisees are getting on his case and some family turn up to come and get him in Mark 3.20. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. Now, we don't know if Mary was there with them at that point. We do know that she turned up a bit later. Why would she turn up later? I think it's because she really loved him. She really cared for him. If your child is starting this ministry and he's doing great, great things, changing people's lives, there are miracles all over the place, crowds of people are following him and he starts to get flack from the religious people. The people that you trust to be your spiritual leaders at this time like the Pharisees were the, were the pastors, the priests, the vicars, those people that you would have grown up under their teaching as, as, a, as a person in this town, in this area, you would trust them implicitly. And when they start giving your son some flack, and people are saying he's lost his mind, he's going crazy, I think her mother's heart was like, oh my Jesus, he's going to get, he's going to get hurt, he's going to get a bad reputation, I, I, want, to, I want to care for him, I want to look after him. He's a grown man, but she's still there. Or maybe she was just like, maybe, maybe I'm aware that he's going to get killed for, for who he is and what he's doing, and she wants to take him away from this troubling situation. Either way, the story really highlights her love for her son, her great love for her son. And the next story I'm just going to share before we finish, it highlights the love for her son even greater. Because... He's had this amazing ministry for three years now, and at the end of it, everybody wants him dead, apart from his closest followers. All of the religious establishment, all of the pastors, the priests, the vicars, they want him dead. He's interfering with what they're doing. The government want him out of the way because they fear an uprising, they fear a revolution, they fear that he's going to come with an army and, and take them down. They, they remember the days of Judas Maccabeus, like 35 years, 40 years earlier, yeah, and he was put down. Maybe this is going to happen again. But this guy, Jesus, he seems to have more of the people's heart. He seems to have more of the people's following. And she is very aware of this. She's seen it. She's been with him every step of the way. She's his mother. She loves him so much. She cares so deeply for him. And she is there on that last day. The most painful day of her life. When they went to present Jesus at the temple years ago there was a guy there called Simeon and he prophesied over her son now she went through all that crazy stuff and I know I've just jumped back in time but, but he's eight days old he's going to get circumcised be dedicated at the temple so she's doing the right thing the faithful thing the worshipful thing taking her son to be dedicated to God and there's a guy there called Simeon who prophesies and says that this is going to be the Redeemer of Israel. This is the one that's going to change everything. Where's that? Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. That word probably came back to haunt her on that last day. A sword will come to pierce your soul too. Mum, you've got a beautiful child with you right now. But a day will come. He will break your heart. Not through any doing of his own. But because the Romans will crucify him. To carry that with you all those years. Knowing that God's fulfilment of his promise over your life and over the nation is going to come about at the cost at the sacrifice of your own heart yes yeah, she has other children and you love your other children but if you lose a child that is just such a weight to bear could you imagine and there she is on that last day at the cross seeing her son get crucified and Jesus says to her, or says to John, even his, his most loved disciple, 
This is your mother. Take care of her. I love my mum. I want someone to take care of her. I know my brothers and sisters will probably do a good job, but John, I trust you to take care of my mum. And I trust my mum to take care of you. He's crucified. That heart-wrenching moment has passed. The pain is still raw and it's still very real. He's been resurrected. There is hope again. My son has returned to me. He has beaten the grave. But then he ascends into heaven. What does she think? How does she respond? I'll tell you how she responds. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. She responds to this heartbreaking thing that's happened in her life with strength, with faith, with power, in prayer. That, as far as we know, is Mary's story. I'm sure that some of us can relate to some of those elements of that story. It's going to take two minutes if I can. Can I just carry on for two more minutes? Yeah? Just a couple of the lessons that we've learnt about her life. One, Mary, she loved God and she held to his ways. That she said that I am the Lord's servant. She attended the festivals. She kept the sacrificial laws. And she obviously, God, God chose her. God chose her for her heart, for her character. She loved God and held to his ways. Two, she was brave. She was possibly one of the bravest women that ever walked the earth. To be given the news at such a young age that that the responsibility that you've got on your shoulders is huge. You are going to raise the Son of God, the one that is going to change the face of human history forever. And she stuck by him. She stuck through with it. She was brave. She she handles the angel better than some shepherds. She goes to Egypt with a newborn son. She is outspoken at a wedding to her son, knowing who he was. And she attends her son's crucifixion. What strength this woman has. She had great faith, number three. She understood and held on to the angel's promise. She listened to Simeon, his prophecies. And despite the opposition that she had from her betrothed husband-to-be, She held on to the promise over her life. She was going to see it through. God was doing something incredible in and through her life. She loved her son, number four, and his friends. She was thoughtful of all of the prophecies spoken over her and over her son's life. She believed in him at the time of his first miracle. She cared for him when the people were against him. She loved him deeply. And I believe that she was wise. She privately pondered the words of God over her life. She she made the right decision when she first fell pregnant to go and see Elizabeth early on in her story. And she didn't shout about the promises of her son in the town. We don't see any record of that. Otherwise, people would flock to their little village to come and see, come and see. She kept these things in her heart. So mums, on this Mother's Day, I pray that you can emulate this great mother of history. For you young ladies, I pray that this mother is someone that you aspire to be like. For you older ladies, I pray that you take these lessons on board and you take care of your spiritual children in the house today. Because there is a great need. The Bible talks about there are many mentors but not enough fathers. But I believe that goes for the girls as well. That goes for them just as much. Girls need love and care and support. For you men, 
I pray that you honour and love your wives, your girlfriends, the women in your life. And for you children, I pray that you go home and you honour your mum, for she has had too many trials in life to even care to telling you about. So much she keeps private in her heart. She is a strong woman indeed. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you that on this day we get to celebrate mums. I thank you on this day that we get to look at the life of Mary, your own mother, Jesus, and, and see the strength that she had through her own life to get through the most terrible, terrible of days. And I thank you for the great faith that she had and she displayed for all the world to see and that all generations will call her blessed. So thank you. Thank you for this great example. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, church, I, I pray that you have an awesome Mother's Day. Uh, go, and, go and say that you love your mum. Go and give someone a hug. Uh, hang around for some tea and coffee. And, and mums, I know that you've got a lot of work to do when you go home. No doubt you've still got to cook your own dinner. So be blessed. Have a great time. Love you guys.